Hello friends, welcome to Friends of Max. This video is a continuation of our previous video on best practices of exchange. In our last video, we covered introduction to exchange, how exchange fits into API lifecycle, what can be hosted into exchange, and how to load assets into exchange. In today's Friends of Max video, we will be discussing what is asset versioning and its best practices, how to find assets in exchange and best practices of exchange management. So let's get started. Let's take a look at asset versioning and the best practices around asset versioning. Each asset basically is versioned in the sense that each time you create or change an asset, the version of the asset changes. So whenever you create an asset, these are the four key things which are created. Group ID, asset ID, version and API version. Group ID and asset ID are created by default when you actually publish or create an asset. Usually customers don't change it, but what customers have to change a lot is the version of it. So initially when you create an asset, it is always created as 1.0.0 and when anytime you make a change, the version needs or keeps getting updated. And the API version, this is only for asset type as API like REST API, SOAP API, API fragment and you won't see this for a connector or example or template. So the relationship between API version and actual asset version is the key here, which we will talk about that in the coming slides. And who defines the API version is the actual developer who created that API. So we limit the number of assets in exchange what uh, customers can create to avoid any resource exhaustion attack. The limit is basically 500 for trial accounts and 100,000 for master rocks, which excludes any deleted assets or, and exchange generated assets by MuleSoft. So just so you know, each version of asset is considered as an asset. If a customer has 10 versions of an asset, then it is counted as 10 different assets. Customers also get notified about their utilization when 80% of threshold is reached. If you reach 100%, the exchange portal throws an error and you cannot create any new asset or any new version anymore. For effective utilization, what we recommend as a best practice is to clean up the assets which no longer are needed at regular basis. It is very important to have versioning. Exchange follows semantic versioning model of major, minor and patch exactly like the product version 4.2.2 of MuleSoft for example. Asset versioning is just similar to that. Each asset can have multiple asset versions and each API version can have multiple versions of an asset. Let's say you have an API created which is version v1 and published that asset as 1.0.0. Now you made a small change like you added a custom parameter to the mocking service. Now that change will not change the actual API version v1 but that will change your version number which is a very minor change. If you added changes which are bigger than patching, then still your API version will be v1. If you're changing the asset itself, then you need to make the API version to v2. So for v1, you can have 1.0.0, but for v2, you cannot have 1.0.1. You need to understand what change needs what level of change, which we will see in the next slide. Now we will talk about when it requires a major change. These are the different types of changes service contract change, data contract change, representation format change, and accessibility change. The changes which require a major version is if you are adding new operation arguments which are mandatory, if you are changing existing endpoints or operations, and any type of responses. If the customers are already using API asset and now you're making some changes to the existing working API, then in this case it is a major change as the customer is directly impacted because they need to make changes on their end to adapt to those changes. So in this case, we need to change to major version and adding any new API operations at this time doesn't require version change. If you are removing or modifying existing data types, for example, order ID or customer ID, in this case, you have to change to major version. If it is an optional element or derived element, then you don't need to change to major version. In case of representation, if you remove existing form of how you represent uh, how you present your API, then it is a major change. If you are adding new type of representation, then it is not a major change. In case of accessibility, if you are restricting permissions on API, then the user is directly impacted because your user might not be, uh, might not have right permissions to do so. 
and if you are relaxing permissions then it is not a major change plus the user is having a working api when to change what in version when api structure changes which needs consumer to adopt the interface then it is a major version change and if something is changing within the api and customer doesn't have to make any change or if it is a simple bug fix then it will be a minor version change Patch, patch version is backward compatibility of bug fixes and no one gets impacted here. One thing about asset versioning is to perform monthly asset review. Let's say I'm an admin of exchange and I'm having a monthly asset review meeting and I have 100 assets last month and now I have 150 assets. So what are these 50 assets that got created? Who created it? Are we using those old assets? Should we deprecate those versions or should we delete those assets? Always between your version to version, let's say you have 1.0.0, now you are making it as 1.2.0. In that case, always document each and every version to differentiate how it varies from previous versions and leverage asset versioning documentation to do that. Now, let's talk about API version. Always follow prefixing the numbers with V, like V1, V2, etc. Do not make it complex by adding V1.0.0 or V1.0.23, etc. As a best practice, include your API version in the application URL. In this example, you are calling v1. If you want to call v2, then you can simply change it to v2 and aligning this with documentation, you can clearly differentiate the changes to the APIs. To search functionality in Exchange, we are leveraging an application network graph. Any point Exchange graph search provides improved discoverability with different search capabilities. One is Advanced search where you can find assets based on asset properties such as name, description, tags or categories associated with that asset. You can apply filters like type, organization, category and tags. For match criteria, display why an asset is returned and you can save your search and combination of filters as shortcuts. Now let's deep dive into best practices of exchange management. Coming to exchange roles, exchange has three types of roles. If you go to access management in any point platform, you will have three roles. One is exchange admin, two is exchange contributor, and three is exchange viewer. So an admin can basically manage the portal like a public portal, create dashboards within the portals, customize them, add pictures and make them look fancy, manage reviews and can set privacy settings for each and every type of asset. A contributor is the one who actually creates content and manages their own content. Let's say I can create and manage my own content and reviews. Exchange viewer is like a consumer who doesn't know anything but wants to use that particular API. Then the consumer can consume assets with this role. Categories are just like an island grocery store which make your search easy by categorizing the asset. For example, you can make certain type of assets as searchable by creating an API type as system API or a combination of multiple categories such as API type as system API and product as Salesforce. From the best practices, if you see there are only three types of users you can create. The issue is that there is no proper distribution of duties like if you are an exchange contributor, you can pretty much do anything. You can touch any asset, you can create assets on your own. No one is regulating as to what you're doing. So that is something which any company has to keep in mind while giving this exchange contributor role. Exchange as such doesn't enforce any duty separation. Another thing is, let's say I'm the user and you are an admin. I need to use an asset or an API. You cannot give me viewer role because I can see all the assets. Since I only need to see one asset or an API, Exchange administrators can share only an individual asset. Another best practice is to perform periodic audits or some monthly reviews and check the assets or quality of assets, who is owning the assets. Also specify terms and conditions for your API assets so that users get prompted while downloading and that a user must follow when they are requesting to start using these assets. Also asset tagging is pretty important. Once you start creating an asset, you can put that asset in a particular category or you can tag this asset or add tag names to that category or custom fields. So custom fields, this is where we can do a lot of things. We can add support cases. In real life situation, you can add what that asset is doing. Is it for that system API or let's say you have an organization and two or three business units. Is this for that business unit or let's say I have Salesforce and AWS kind of systems which I can connect to using MuleSoft. So I can say what system it is connecting to and tag that with that particular AWS system. A custom field is a key value pair that can be added to an asset version. So with the key value pairs, 
anytime we search we can search using custom fields as well and it will again make it easy for users to find those assets because we are not talking about 10 to 15 assets where you scroll down if you actually go to the assets provided by MuleSoft, if you keep scrolling, they keep loading. There are so many assets that it is good to have a tagging strategy to overcome these scrolling challenges. We were talking about how to have a healthy practice of monthly auditing and deleting. There are two ways of not wanting those assets. You can either delete or deprecate them. Let's talk about deleting an asset. There is a seven day rule. Let's say you have created an asset today and you deleted it within seven days after creation of the asset, then it is a hard delete. It not only deletes the asset, but deletes any sort of existence of that asset, like the name in the database or wherever it is stored or any sort of mapping with that asset. So if you delete an asset within seven days of creation, you can reuse the name of the asset. You can reuse anything as part of the asset data. If you delete the asset after seven days of creation, then it is a soft delete and you cannot use the same name. If you want to create a new asset with the same name, then you have to have uh, uh, have to create it in a different business group. So keep that in mind when you are deleting an asset. Asset dependencies. So whenever you are deleting an asset and there, is, there are asset dependencies, then it will throw a warning that the assets which you are deleting are depending on this asset. So if you delete it, then it might harm those assets. Let's say if it is a policy type of asset, the policy applied to the APIs, then if it is an already applied policy, then you cannot delete because it is actually applied to some API instance which is running. So if you get a warning and you cannot do, uh, the, you cannot do it until you remove that instance or remove that policy. Let's talk about deprecating. Deprecating works on version of an asset. You cannot delete an asset, but you are basically deprecating only that version which is not being used, but the asset is still accessible to the users. You can always throw a message that is that it is a deprecated version. We can also always revert or bring back the asset version. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video.